Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King. It is so nice to be with you tonight for choir practice. I just love choir practice and the chance it gives us to get together and, and just chat about things. Uh, it is fun to see everybody piling in. Thank you so much to our mods, first and foremost. Thank you for managing things and staying on top of things. Uh, Wendy Grimstead, hello, and High Priestess Illumination. Mimi J2, gosh, uh, everybody's just pouring in quickly. Victoria Chile, um, thank you, thank you. Darcy Ann 66, thank you for that kind super chat. And folks, uh, we have got two amazing guests tonight, and, and uh, there may be a bunch of questions, and they're willing to answer some questions, so you might want to consider those super chats as a, as a way to float it to the top and force us to see them, because sometimes they just go by fast, but, but thank you. Uh, Jay Fletcher. Hello. Um, let's see, Sandra Chapman. Hi to the whole profiling evil family and Maui girl. Looks like people are bailing in here from, uh, all over the world, which is really fun to see. Vicki Birdwell, Four Sons Mom, a ton of stuff has been happening lately. I hope you caught the video and the story map that I created, um, uh, on the uh, Dante Lucas case, and I've been uh, corrected by a bunch of you about whether it's Dante or Dante, and I've heard it said both ways uh, by reporters and the court, so I, I, I'm assuming it's Dante, but uh, anyway, please forgive me. It's, it's just uh, one of those things that sometimes are, are, are hard to get, but the important thing is it's about Kelsey Schelling and that little unborn baby and this murder trial. And I hope that you went back and looked at that story map, gives you a pretty comprehensive look of the case and the things that have gone on in that. Um, also been on the phone a lot with Adventures with Purpose on uh, not only the Randy Leach case, but uh, the Brian McKenzie case. Uh, picked up an, another case that they asked me uh, just last night to look into, and we'll spend some time looking uh, into those. Uh, we also had some really interesting feedback from uh, Sheriff Arbon, the Weber County Sheriff that we had on a few weeks ago, talking about how you can embrace this public CSI, crowdsourced intelligence, and the value of that. And we're going to see him more often uh, popping back in uh, from time to time. Miss Sophia, thanks a lot. And, uh, and folks, again, please just... Uh, pop up your questions and jump in uh, throughout the night. Make sure that we see those. I want to thank the back office. Please shout out to the back office. They are back there working their guts out, trying to get all the questions and get things in front of us. And again, I'll say it, I've said it before. Thanks for the high level, the, the high road that you take in the way you ask questions. I really love how um, professional and how, um, how, decent you all are. So thank you so much for that. Uh, make sure you're checking out channel memberships and all of that stuff. And let's get, let's get to work. Let's get choir practice rolling. I want to introduce Dr. Yanya Lalich and Andrea. In if the back office will bring those two in, Dr. Lalich on top, wave to everybody. Hello. And uh, Andrea Lithgow on the bottom. Hi. Thank you to uh, dear Andrea, who I have known Andrea for 30 years, and yet we really have uh, gotten close in the last year. But let me just quickly introduce the two of you, and uh, maybe you could take a moment and say hello to everyone. Dr. Yanya Lalich is a emeritus professor of sociology at California State University at Chico. She's now emeritus, but she's still teaching on a regular basis, lecturing on a regular basis. She is an internationally known author and educator and probably one of the smartest people I have ever met when it comes to cult behaviors and cult um, extremist groups. And Dr. Lalich, you and I became friends just a year ago as I reached out to you for some advice on some areas that I was really struggling with in writing my new book the uh, on the Zion Society. And folks, I hope you'll grab that book and we'll pop it up from time to time, but it's uh, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. But I leaned upon you uh, as I tried to kind of grapple what I had learned after years of investigating cults, but 
I wanted to get your unique perspective and, and I, I just owe you this huge debt of gratitude. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I was happy to help out. Well, uh, take, take a moment and just let, let people know a little bit about your background doc and, and uh, what's kind of brought you down this path. And then I want to introduce Andrea. Okay. I'll try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I was in a cult myself in the 70s and 80s. I joined when I was 30 years old, so I wasn't a kid. Um, it was um, it was a political cult, and you know we were about bringing you know changing, getting rid of racism and sexism, and, and fighting for social justice and things like that. It was very restrictive, and um, I was in high leadership and in the inner circle, so I saw a lot of the bad stuff that went on behind the scenes. Um, the leader was actually a drunk and a complete megalomaniac and was very harsh. Anyway, I got out, <clears throat> excuse me, I got out after 10 years um, because in the end we all got out. We had our revolution and we, um, the leadership came together and told everybody what was really going on while the, the leader was out of town. And we uh, took a vote and we voted to expel her and dissolve the organization. Uh, oh. It's a, a very unusual ending uh, for a cult group. Um, did, did, I hate to interrupt, but did the leader actually <laughs> accept the vote of this group oh, of people? Oh, interesting. So she came back. So we, we um, picked a team of people to meet with her. And we went to the house and got rid of her Rottweil guard dogs. I mean, we didn't get rid of them, but we took them somewhere and we, <laughs> and we got rid of the guns and the little team was waiting to meet with her. And one person was wearing a wire so that all of us could hear what happened. So her bodyguard picked her up from the airport, brought her home. She sat down in her big leather chair and, uh, and they're trying to tell her, you know, well, while you were gone, you know, we had this meeting and the party's over. I mean, we were a political party, so it was kind of a joke, the party's over. And she didn't get it. She was like, huh? You know, she didn't get it. And at some point, I love this story, at some point she pu pulled out a cigarette and held up her cigarette. And of course we did everything for her, right? We blew, practically blew her nose. So she held up her cigarette and nobody got up to light her cigarette. And that's when she got it. And since she, then she like threw down the cigarette and stood up and started swearing. And anyway, it was over. And they told her um, she had a month to move out of the house she was in because it was being rented by one of the members. And um, everything that we could take away, we did. But she had bank accounts and IRAs and all that stuff. You know, money had been funneled to her. So, yeah, so I got out. I went to New York. I was living in San Francisco. I moved to New York because I wanted to get away. And... Um, I was able to get a job in publishing because I part of one of my assignments in the group was to build a publishing house. So I learned about publishing. Um, I was a complete mess. I did fine at my job, but I would come home at night and I would think I'm going to write about this experience because that's always kind of been my orientation. And I would sit at my word in the, those days, it was word processors and <clears throat> I'd sit at my word processor and I would just start crying and crying and, so I wasn't getting very far. And what happened actually that kind of helped me was I, my boss took me out to dinner after six months. And he, and he said, you know, Yanya, your work is great. Everything you do is great. Your writing is great and blah, blah, blah. He said, but I have to say, you've been here for six months and I've never, I've never seen you smile and I've never heard you laugh. Wow. And that completely blew me away because I, I kind of consider myself a humorous person. I mean, you know, I'm always making jokes and stuff. And, and I, I realized I had no idea of how of in sociology, as we say, the presentation of self. I had no idea how I was coming across to people. So that got me into therapy. And luckily in New York at the time, there was a cult clinic where therapists specialized in cult after effects. So I did therapy for a few years. Um, I have to say that that woman saved my life. I had enormous guilt and shame because I was in leadership and I did a lot of really sh shitty things to people, pardon my French. Um, and I thought about grad school in, and um, 
and I couldn't make the decision. It was like, I can't make that decision. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started going to cult conferences and um, not conferences by cults, but conferences about cults. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> And I actually had already written a couple of books and kept thinking about grad school. And so eventually I was able to make that decision. And so when I was 50, I started grad school and started a PhD program. Um, wow. Got my PhD by age 55. And then I was hired at Chico State in the sociology department. And um, of course I had a huge teaching mode there, but I continued my research. And throughout all of this, I did a lot of work with families and running support groups for former members and things like that. Um, I wrote a few more books and then uh, I retired, I think three years ago and left Chico and live in the Bay Area and am busier than ever. As Mike I was gonna said. say, we, we, have, we have struggled getting a day that would work. So you're not retired, you just have a different job. Exactly, I mean, especially lately. I mean, I've just been doing tons of podcasts and interviews and print media interviews. And um, I actually wrote a memoir uh, which I'm trying to get published. And, um, you know, so it's been a pretty busy time, but that's good. I mean, it was good to be busy during the pandemic when we were all kind of sheltered in. So. Wow. Well, let, let me introduce you to Andrea, one yes. of the survivors of the Zion Society okay. cult. Andrea and I met in 1991 when she was 15 years old. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> I've often talked, in fact, I, um, I think I, the first time Andrea heard this story, uh, I, I remembered her vividly that when we met last year for the first time, uh, because I still have emblazoned in my memory her face as she was loaded into the family services vehicles on the morning of the raid. Right. And uh, in our eyes locked as I watched that van driving away, wondering what on earth was going to happen to this kid. But she has turned into a remarkable human being who has, uh, in my opinion, tackled her recovery with dignity and uh, determination. She refuses to be victimized by her past, but she openly admits and probably will tonight that it it's a daily effort to yeah. do that. Um, Andrea, I, I, uh, you spent your childhood being indoctrinated with these destructive beliefs. Would you just take a moment and give everyone a sketch of what your life was like from the time of the raid till today? Yes. Um, I do want to thank you for your invitation, Mike. You're so, you're so sweet. Um, I do want to point out though, that my indoctrination started about four years old. So I never had a chance really, but, but once, um, Mike came in and rescued us all. And I was about 18 roughly, cause I was, yeah, it took a little while to even leave the, the, the neighborhood. I mean, we were just kind of shell shocked. We didn't know what was happening. We thought we were still gonna serve our master even though he was in jail. And so it was very disorienting for about 18 months before I finally moved away. And I had no life skills. Um, I was trained to be a, a good sex slave. So I had that life skill and I knew I needed really good credit. And those are the only things that I knew. I didn't know anything else. My parents had joined another cult. Um, I just kind of went out into the world and stumbled around for about 10 years in a haze. And I even got married and then divorced. And um, it was about age 27 when similar to you, um, where you're just having a certain conversation. You're like, yeah, I think, I think I need some therapy. And I remember that conversation and, and um, the person that I was dating kind of helped me find the right person. And I myself stumbled into an extraordinary therapist in Los Angeles that specializes in, in child abuse and, and loss of self due to childhood trauma. And she's still practicing today and she's written a book and Arlene Drake. I mean, she's just incredible. Um, and so I just knew, I, I had an awareness that I was naive and I was ashamed about that, but I didn't know what to do about it. I had this vague sensation that my zero education was part of my problem because I didn't have grade school or high school. Um, and so at early thirties, I stumbled into a kind of a relationship where I just uh, kind of had a little bit of support and 
And I started at Santa Monica College and did so well that I couldn't even believe it. I was like flabbergasted how much fun I was having going to school and just learning. I was so curious because I had such a horribly sheltered experience that everything was new and exciting to me. And I was, I was 33 when I started school. So I just was amongst all these 17 and 18 year olds and I was like eating it up and they're like in the back, like, you know, picking their nose or whatever. And I'm in the front like, no, give me more, give me more. And I, I just, um, I ended up doing my first two years at community college and then I got into UC Berkeley and they invited me with a full scholarship and it was like one of the most extraordinary experiences of my entire life. I just like pinched myself every day that I walked on campus. It was amazing. Um, and then cause I was broke, I needed to make money and I started a business that it just was very randomly happened and it supported me for almost 15 years now, um, making ceramic jewelry. And so I've, I've had a business and hired people and had employees. And, and I want you to tell everyone what that business is because the, the back office is going to put up the link. And oh, folks, okay. if you ever want some really cool jewelry, this is the place to go. And I say that as a customer also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell them, Andrea. Oh, so I'm wearing a piece and it's handmade ceramic and it's um, called Dandy Jewelry. So dandyjewelry.com, you can find me there. But it's it's all very handmade and of course, one of a kind. It's just an extraordinary thing that I just figured out because I'm a maker and I feel really lucky, honestly. And the final piece is that when the pandemic hit, I just, everything switched around and I realized that I should go get my graduate degree. So now I'm doing a creative writing program and I'm so, having so much fun <laughs> and like it, like my mind is getting blown every class and I'm just having a ton of fun and I'm just a really happy learner. So, um, so Dr. Lalich, um, I mean, what, what kind of comments do you have? Uh, Andrea just uh, in the last year has gone back and now applied for her master's and she's now in her studies for her graduate degree. And, and, uh, I just, I just am so proud of her and, and she's being way too humble about the journey, but you would understand how difficult that journey was to become a student and a successful student. Oh yeah. I mean, your story is amazing, Andrea. I'm just, you know, I mean, you should be so proud of yourself and, and, I mean, to get a full scholarship to UC Berkeley, not everybody gets that. <coughs> so <coughs> I was pretty excited. I cried for about 20 minutes when I discovered that. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, I know how hard it is to make those decisions and, and to have the self-confidence to do that. I mean, I remember the first time I, I went to a, um, I signed up for a writing class at NYU when I was in my full recovery period. And when it got to the point where, you know, we wrote stories and it got to the point where you had to stand up and read your own, your story for people to comment on, I dropped out of the class then. Cause I was like, oh no, because that's all we did in my group was criticize each other. And there was no way I was gonna stand up in a room and be criticized by these people. So, I mean, I know what it takes. And I also know, I mean, the, the excitement that you felt at, at learning and just learning about the world is incredible. Um, I don't know if you've seen my last book, Escaping Utopia, but I, I want to read it. I interviewed I interviewed sixty five individuals who who were born or raised in a cult, and so I kind of squished it down to I used six narrators to tell the story. But you know, it's it's very similar to yours. Yeah, there's the cover. Um, right where, you know, when people get out, it's like, the, the you know, it's like uh, so many of them said, I feel like I've just landed from Mars, right? It's like, like learning everything about the world and yeah. struggling because this is one of my pet peeves that there aren't resources for people in our society. You know, you can't go to a domestic violence shelter. You don't qualify for that, right? So there's like, there's nothing that tells you how to go to school or how to get a driver's license. And so many people end up, you know, in the sex trade, they end up living on the streets, couch surfing. There are so many suicides. It's just criminal. Um, and, and maybe some, that's something we can get you involved in, Mike, because it's a, it's, a real, it's a real human dilemma. It's a real health issue in our country right now. So I applaud you, Andrea, for you. getting through everything that you did. 
You know, I should I should really add that my success in school really came from me using the disability services. Okay. I mean, I didn't know that that would even be a thing for me. And I, I right. just started bawling from the intensity and anxiety of test taking through a couple of tests. And my professors right. were very kind and just asked me how I, like, what was wrong. And I just kind of told them like, hey, I, I never went to school. I don't know what it's like to take a test and I'm just freaking out inside and I just can't even handle it. They're like, I think that you should walk over the disability center. Mm -hmm. And that dramatically changed everything and allowed me to be a success in school. So, and I felt like I deserved it. I felt like I leveled the playing ground. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. You know, I think this brings a really interesting thing that I want to kind of step back on, uh, Dr. Lalich, that, that maybe you could comment on as far as the bigger picture, but uh, the cults that I have dealt with have been primarily um, polygamous style groups or this particular group and a few satanic cults along the way, about 230 of them. But, but what I found of those that dealt with children, there was consistency in trying to keep the children from gaining an education. It just wasn't part of the of the necessity right. because of the the end of days doomy feelings that they had. Maybe Andrea could speak to that. And, uh, and then you could have some comments on that. And, and to Darcy Ann, thank you, uh, Dr. Lalit. She'd also like you to maybe um, talk about political cults, but I'm going to mm -hmm. save that to the end because okay. if it gets too explosive, then I'm going to have the everything disconnect. So, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about that. Andrea, maybe share with her um, what your, education experience was because the majority of the kids, the, the, probably the highest level of education was third grade for many, a few right. got through high school. Right. So the situation in our house is I'm the youngest of six. And so by the time I was of school age, my mother had already fallen off the deep end for lack of a better way to put this, these cults. Um, so I started kindergarten in our the public school I was supposed to go to in the very small town we lived in. And by the time it was time to get into like second grade, she'd already decided that that was evil. And she pulled my sister and I out and she did homeschool us, but it was not engaging. I didn't learn anything. And by the time we entered the cold when I was age 12, I was a really, really good reader. I knew math because I was a seamstress and that was about it. And then Contrary to what's in your book, Mike, I don't know who tried to tell you that we did schooling. Like that's, I, when I was reading that today, I was like, what the hell did whoever claim to him that we did school? Because we never did. Yeah, the, no adult, the adult leadership are the ones that were saying that there was homeschooling to keep the public school system off their back. We never yeah. did it. It just never happened. Never. So I got no schooling during the high school years. And then, and that was it. <laughs> And well, then I, I love that woman, thank you. I mean, Dr. Lalich, what, what what do you think about that? And and help us understand this from a more global perspective. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I mean, I already more or less knew, but I really saw for certain when I did the research for that book, Escaping Utopia, is the prevalence of so-called homeschooling. And um I think it's a travesty because so many of these cults say they homeschool. They don't really do proper schooling. Most of the states <clears throat> have very few, if any, regulations, you know, so here, okay, we're homeschooling. All they're really doing is teaching you the, the speeches of the leader or something like that. Um, and you're sitting in a room with, you know, his, his or her pictures all over. And, and it's a way not, not only to not, um, educate the children in, in what would be a normal societal way, but it's also a way to keep them away from society. It's a way for them not to see, oh, there are other ways to live. Like this is not normal. Uh, so it serves those two, those two purposes. And it's, um, it's very troubling to me, the amount of homeschooling in our country anyway. And um, so many of the cults hide behind that. It's really, it's terrible. And it has a devastating effect on the children. Um, because as I was saying earlier, when they get out, they don't, they don't, they don't know, you know, some people get out, they don't even know their real name. Um, and so there they are. And it's like, they don't know about how to get a GED or anything like that. And um, it really is a huge setback for them on top of everything else that they have to go through in terms of recovering from the experience. 
Wow. So Andrea, um, I, I think back on that. And one thing I remember and to, and for that $10 donation bite me, thank you so much. That's very kind. I remember so clearly as we looked at that number one, thinking that we as government have almost used homeschooling as an excuse to not have to worry about that segment of the population. Right. And, and I think that that's one of those lessons that have been learned, maybe forgotten. I don't know. But uh, you talked about, Andrea, on many occasions, as did the other survivors of the Zion Society, about the fact that while you weren't good in most of the academic areas, you guys excelled when it came to reading, at least some kinds of reading. <laughs> well, Mike, um, my parents moved to Paradise. You know Paradise, right? Paradise? Paradise, Utah is a town oh, of Paradise, Utah. People. 500 people. <laughs> so that's where I spent my childhood from birth to 12 years old. And wow. there was no cul-de-sac. It was a highway. There was no, you know, no school, no TV. So I read two to three books a week. Oh, and I, I read everything. <laughs> books that were way beyond I should have been reading, just a little bit of everything. So was there a library? I mean, somehow my, we, we went into town once a week to get groceries and we would just hop off the library. I think the bookmobile, would, we'd figure out the bookmobile. Um, I had comic books <laughs> and I sewed, I sewed, I was an extremely talented seamstress by the time I was eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> like I was making my own clothes that were very functional by the time I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Wow. You, you know, I have to tell you, Dr. Lalich, it was interesting because when we brought the kids together for the first time after 30 years, we showed them some images from the, uh, raid. And one of those images had uh, one of the rooms where the sewing was occurring. And Andrea, why don't you share what that experience was like for you? To see the photographs or be in that room? <laughs> yeah, well, both. <laughs> well, honestly, all the photographs that you showed us, were it was very jarring because I remembered, you know, very vividly standing in each of those rooms and things that happened in each of those rooms. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, I was kind of grossed out about how ugly our decor was. It was just so awful. <laughs> like I, yeah. Hmm. Well, folks, I'm, I'm talking with Andrea Lithgow, one of the survivors of the Zion Society and Dr. Yanya Lalich, uh, Professor Emeritus. Dr. Lalich, I wanted to just take a minute before we get into some of these characteristics and just, uh, I, I have been shocked at the amount of interest there has been in cults lately. And I, I know that you have been busier than at any time. You just finished a documentary for HBO. And, uh, and that documentary, I, I think is doing extremely well. And you all, uh, that one was on he Heaven's Gate, right? Yeah. HBO Max. Yes. Yeah. So the documentary on Heaven's Gate and, uh, yeah. and why, why don't you just talk a little bit about um, that experience of doing that documentary and the kind of the pieces that you filled in there. And we'll hopefully have people go over and visit that. And then I want to talk about another one that you've been involved in. Sure. Um, well, Heaven's Gate was um, one of the cults that I knew a great deal about. Um, I met people who had been in the group uh, who left, obviously, before the suicides and I was working with families, uh, one family in particular in New York who, whose daughter had joined the group. Uh, so if, if people may or may not remember, but Heaven's Gate was the group that uh, in the mid nineties, uh, 39 people committed suicide, including the leader in a mansion in, in, uh, Sandy, in a suburb of San Diego. Um, and the leaders were this couple, um, Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite, um, who started the group in the mid seventies. And so most of the people had been in the group since then over 20 years, it was, uh, you know, their entire life at that point, six people were, <clears throat> six people were recruited in the mid nineties or in the early nineties. <coughs> so when the, um, when the suicides happened initially, the police thought that they were all monks because they all looked exactly alike and they were under these shrouds in this house. And as soon as I saw it on the news, I realized it was 
uh, T and Dote. That was their name in the group, T and Dote. It was T and Dote's group. And I was actually calling the police in San Diego saying, hey, I know who this group is. And of course, nobody called me back. I think they thought I was a crank. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> they had released videos that were being shown on the TV over and over of the, of the leader and then the members kind of saying goodbye. <clears throat> and they each had like three minutes. Excuse me, I have to get some water. Um, so <clears throat> I actually had to call the family in New York and tell them, um, you know, if you turn on your TV today, I have to warn you, you're going to see your daughter uh, who was part of this group. I mean, it was one of the hardest phone calls I oh, ever goodness. made in my life. Um, so this, um, this documentary, which came out oh, a few months ago, I guess now, um, it's for, it's a four part series and, um, it's really, I think they did an excellent job and it's, it's very well done. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think everybody got wrong about Heaven's Gate for a long time was that everyone thought that Doe, the male leader, was the leader because he was there in the end. But actually, the, the real leader was the woman, Bonnie Nettles. Uh, she kind of recruited him and he was her follower. Uh, <clears throat> and they were, <clears throat> their their ideology was that they weren't actually human beings. They were actually beings from what they called the next level above human. And they were in training to go back to the next level, which was their home. Um, <clears throat> so once you've accepted the idea that you're not human, you know, how do you leave? You, you know, you're going to then leave and go out in the street and say, oh, I'm not human. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like part of the way to really bind them to the group, right? Because they, they accepted the fact that they weren't humans, that they, that this they called it their vehicle. This human shell was just their vehicle that they kind of lived in while they were going through this training. Unfortunately for them, Bonnie, the leader, the female leader, died in the late 80s um, of cancer. So she died of this very human disease, which totally made no sense according to their ideology. So they kind of had to rework it. Um, and then he was left and he was very insecure about being the leader. Um, so what they did was a kind of a wedding ceremony where he went out and got all these rings and they were now, they got to each pick their ring and they were now married to him and married to her. Uh, and the, between them, it was never a sexual relationship. It was completely platonic. He was actually a homosexual, which was part of his issue of uh, not being able to sort of survive very well in regular society in Texas in the fifties. So, um, so they had this kind of wedding ritual that bound them to the group. And it was really almost more the members who convinced him that yes, he could do it. He could be the leader. Um, so, and the other thing that came out in the course after the deaths was that she was the entire time she was writing to her children back home even though no one else could have any contact with their families. Um, she was writing letters to her daughter saying, do the right thing, go to college, you know, get, choose a career, you know? So it really showed the, yeah, it really showed the deceptive nature of it. I mean, if she really believed all this, um, you know, why would she be writing her daughter and going against the very rules of the group? So you got to see some of the hypocrisy there. This, this is just so incredible. And so it, it's clear to me uh, that I've got to have you back for one thing, because we got to talk about <laughs> Heaven's Gate. I want to talk about your work with stars on Seduced about Seduced. Nexium. Yes. Uh, and, and we have had some interesting conversations, even as short as today, about some of the players in that group. Right. Um, so I cool. hope everyone out there that you'll you'll look into these and we'll we'll get uh, Dr. Lalich to commit toward the end here to come back. Uh, but I, but I, here, here's, I guess the pervasive question, doc, it, it's the question of those cults and the Zion society, which I want to get back on here is right. how is it that anyone could believe this drivel and be manipulated into joining these kinds of repulsive, destructive cults? 
Well, I think there's a few things that's important to know. One is that two thirds of people who join cults are recruited by a friend, a family member, or a coworker. So right there, it's harder to say no to someone you know, right? So if that person invites you to the first Bible study or the first uh, yoga session or the first book group or whatever it might be, you're going to go because you're, you know, you want to be respectful to your friend. Once they get you to that first thing, then they zero in on you. Uh, cult recruiters are very good at what you do, uh, what they do, I'm sorry. And so they zero in on you. They do what we call love bombing, which is they make you feel very special. Uh, they invite you back. You know, they, they do whatever they can to get you to come back. And you feel kind of, um, you know, this is one of the principles of influence. If, if people have ever read the book by Robert Cialdini, um, there's this obligation feeling that, well, they've been so nice to you and they're asking you to come back. You think, well, I guess I should come back. They've been so nice to me, right? So then you go back to the next thing and it grows from there, right? Um, so that's that's one factor to keep in mind. And then I think the other factor is that um, our society has become very complex and people are looking for a framework to make sense of the world. Mm. And even now during this pandemic, when people have been isolated, you know, they're finding this on the internet, right? They're finding internet communities to be the source of that understanding, that framework for the world. So whenever societies are in turmoil, cults do very well at recruiting, right? And then on top of that, you know, I think all of us on some level are seekers. Um, and, you know, people will say, oh, it's just seekers who join cults. Well, in a sense, we're all seekers. We all want to have a good life. We all want to have a purpose in our life, right? We're all social animals so that we want to be part of something. And most of us want to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves, right? That, well, that's why so many people just join healthy religions, right? You want to have that in your life. So th it's not a negative that you're a seeker. Um, and then what happens with cults is you, you have to come across a cult whose message resonates with you, right? It has to be something that speaks to you. So when you're in those moments, when you're kind of looking for something, you know, I always say, for example, I never could have joined a meditation cult. I can't sit still that long, but a political cult that was going to change the world. Oh boy, that was it for me. Right? So the message has to resonate with you. And that's why those of us on the outside may look at someone who is worshiping some God awful fat guru, who's like sitting on some chair and blowing smoke out of his ears. And you're saying, what, you know, how can they, you know, but that, that didn't resonate with you. The other issue is about, should I go on or am I going too long? Uh, this, no, this is fantastic. And no, you're not going on too long other than I want to, I want to get Andrea's perspective and gosh, I don't know if you've seen, there are hundreds of discussions going on in the chat box next to us and 12 step woman. Thank you for that kind super chat. Andrea, from your perspective, yeah, how would you answer this question? Yeah. Dr. Lollich just highlighted my mother, essentially. I mean, she was a seeker due to her own childhood being traumatic and growing up trying to satisfy her own um, black holes. You know, she never discovered therapy like me I mean, different different decades. And she just kind of, it was a slippery slope for her. And so she was a seeker. She The message she was looking for was, you know, prepare for the last days. She was very drawn into the idea of polygamy because she felt, you know, that it should have never been dumped by the by the LDS church. And um, so actually the Zion Society was the second cult that she had been involved in. That's why I say I've been involved in them since I was about four or five because she was involved in the, the All Red group, which you, I'm sure that you know. Oh, wow. yeah. So we were driving up to Montana to go hang out with them. And I was, a, you know, young girl with these long ugly dresses doing square dances at their big community events, you know? And, and I didn't have a choice. Like I was already brainwashed when I was a little. And so when basically the Zion Society folks got a hold of me to try to lure my sister and I in, I'd already thought that it seemed normal and mm -hmm. the, the love bombing, they, they made me feel super special and more special than my parents or anybody else in my own home had ever made me feel. And I, I as a 12 year old, just like fell in love immediately. Like the love bombing worked. 
<laughs> and they did kidnap my sister and I essentially. Like my parents did not actually not live there first. They took up my sister and I and we lived there. And then my parents kind of moved in at some point later. Mm. So I was never with my parents there ever. Wow. You know, it might be so surprising for people to realize that seemingly normal, intelligent people are joining these kinds of groups every single day. And something I learned over the course of my career, my mentality initially was that th these are just, you know, dim-witted people that are going mm -hmm. in, but these cults are not recruiting <laughs> dim-witted people. They, they want people that are successful, that have money, that have something to offer. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, I don't know. What are your thoughts in that area, doctor? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I say this all the time. I mean, cults recruit the best and the brightest because they want you to run their businesses. They want you to bring in your contacts. They want your money and all of, they want, you know, all of that lends legitimacy to the group. They want you to do their PR, whatever. Um, cults don't want lazy people. They don't want stupid people. They don't want sick people. I mean, in my group, if, if so, I actually always think about this poor woman, this young girl, young woman joined and she had some issues. She had some problems. And our leader was like, get rid of her. You know, she's, you know, we're, so you're not, you know, the cult's not there to take care of you. You're there to take care of the cult leader and keep the cult growing and keep the cult functional. So, you know, the Unification Church, as some people know as the Moonies, I mean, there were many stories of, you know, if somebody had a breakdown or was sick, they would they would literally just dump them in front of a hospital and drive away. Um, so, uh, yeah, cults are looking for people who can perform for them. And that and and so it absolutely. I mean, I've worked with the people, the smartest people from the wealthiest families, from good middle class families, you know, not. It, Absolutely not people who had pre-existing psychological conditions. That that's not who joins cults. Yeah. So so Dr. Lalich, take take me through the first most to me the most critical characteristic that's consistent with cults revolving around the leader. Tell me about that person. Okay. Well, the leader is you know is obviously the person who comes up with the message, the idea that, that they, they are some special being with some special message, whether it's religious, political, you know, self-help, transformational, you know, whatever. Um, the leaders are narcissists, meaning that everything's about them. It's all about their ego. It's all about everybody serving them. Uh, depending on, on their own personal proclivities, um, that, that will mark, you know, that will, uh, affect how what the group is about so whether it, primarily it's about sex money power it's always about power because they're the ones who are in control if it's about money it might be a leader who wants millions uh you know we can think of um bhagwan sri rajneesh the the indian guru who lived in oregon who had 93 rolls royces and every day he'd drive down the road in one of his rolls royces and they, the followers would have to throw roses at him as he drove by, right? So for him, it was that, you know, uh, there was a cult leader, a small political cult in New York. They lived in a brownstone in Brooklyn. He, the leader basically lived in a closet, but what was his thing? He got to have sex with all the women, right? So depending on what their urges are and their needs are, that that's going to shape how the cult is formed. Um, they they're always um, very volatile, volatile individuals and very erratic in their behavior. Like you never know who's going to walk in the room. Is it going to be the nice, sweet cult leader? Or is it going to be the angry, awful cult leader? Right. Uh, so that keeps people on their toes. Right. You're kind of always walking on eggshells. You know, you're just living in a constant state of anxiety because you don't know what to expect. Right. Is this the day you're going to get it or is this the day he's going to love you? Right. Or she. Um, Wow. So they're not they're not nice people. Uh, they're manipulators. They're very good at manipulating. They're very good at reading people. Um, a lot of them are just straight out con artists and started out maybe as a two bit con artist and then figured out how to do this. The issue I think that gets um, I don't know if I'm getting too dark here, if I should turn the light on. Uh, the issue that um, gets people confused, I think, is the idea of charisma. People think that charisma is an attribute 
that an individual is born with, like, oh, he's he was charismatic, he's going to grow up to be charismatic, whatever. Charisma is actually a social relationship. Charisma is about how you respond to that person, right? So if you have a guy who's standing on a soapbox in the middle of the streets in London and he's preaching and he's saying he's speaking for God and nobody's listening to him, he's not charismatic. He doesn't have any followers, right? He's just, you know, some guy standing on a soapbox. So charisma is about how you respond to that person. That's why some people can be in the room with that guru who's blowing smoke out of his ears and think he's absolutely awesome. And other people can go, what the hell? He's like ugly. He looks, you know, what's that cigar in his mouth, right? So, so it's, it's all about how you respond. But by you responding, you're giving that person power. They now have power over you. It's an imbalanced power relationship. And so it's on the charismatic person to keep that charisma alive. That's why they appear now and then and, you know, do magic tricks or do whatever it is they do, hold giant rallies with the thousands of people, get everybody revved up. Um, they have to every now and then do that, but it's your obligation to be devoted to the person who you've granted this charisma to. Um, so amazing. Uh, Andrea, how would you equate this to Arvin, your experience? And what questions would you have for Dr. Lalich? Arvin was describe, short, describe Arvin. Yeah. yeah, he was a short, fat, ugly man. <laughs> and as you put in your book, he looks just like anybody's grandpa. Um, and ironically, he made us all be super thin and he had this big gut, which never occurred to me was not okay. But now it's like that's... Um, that narcissistic behavior. Um, I was terrified of him. I was absolutely terrified. It was exactly what you're, you're describing, Dr. Lalich, is just that he would show up and either fuck us or yell at us for not doing X, Y, or Z, or we're going to hell, or, you know, you just, I mean, I never talked to him. It wasn't like approachable. I couldn't just walk up and start chatting with him about what he was doing in the garden. And it was a very, it was, he was like God. I mean, a Svengali. And, what are my questions for you? Um, I love what you just said about basically that, that that a cult leader doesn't exist unless they have an audience. I mean, that's the way life is. That um, I, I have a question for you. Okay. What, what convinced you that he was a godlike figure? How did that happen? Well, I was already trained to think that way because of my mother. So she already did that. She put her, my father, her husband, she didn't give a shit about. She thought he was a, a total waste of a husband. She talked about it constantly. So I knew that she didn't respect her husband. And she was always looking for some other entity in her life instead. And so it was God or it was a cult leader. And so I already had that idea in my head of like just devote, you know, devotion to a being. Okay. And so when we met him, I mean, when his ladies started collecting, my sister and I taking us over to for little dates, he just was, I mean, I can't even tell you. I, mean, I was 12 and I was just so mm. captured with the love that I was receiving. I'd never gotten that before. And I mean, it's really hard to put into words how you get sucked in and and just start believing the story, like drinking the punch. I mean, it's like they're mixing it, they're handing it to you. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, kind of like what you said earlier about the Heaven's Gate is like, once you have participated in this, like I had nowhere to go. Right. I, I wasn't a liver in the corner with my parents because they were part of it. I didn't have any other extended family, relatives, grandparents, right. older right. siblings that were going to come and save me or rescue me or say what's going on. So I just, like, I was receiving validation for my skills and my sewing skills and my you know, young girl, I guess. And so I think I got sucked in. I mean, this is what I'm going to try to portray in my own memoir is, like, how does this happen? What was my experience as a 12-year-old? Because I don't remember. I just know that I believed everything he said, and I tried really hard to be thin, and I felt like I was going to hell if I couldn't be thin, and... Um, I just 
felt like total shit if somehow I was not in Arvin's good graces. Mm -hmm. And that particular problem has persisted throughout my whole life. Right. That my own critic has taken over instead of Arvin. That if I beat myself up and I'm a perfectionist and no, you got to keep working harder, 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 because there's never, it's never enough. You've never reached your goal. And that's how they keep you hooked. Right. I mean, you know this. And so I distinctly remember that. That was the severe psychological abuse is just that you need to always keep working. Mm -hmm. or it's a goal that's very unclear. You know, um, and uh, I've I've uh, told Andrea that I'm her stepfather all the time now, and I'll, I'm going to remind her we're on a show that I the language should be really careful about. But uh, I I think Doc, it would be really interesting to to maybe explore this idea of why these leaders feel like they have to control every aspect of the cult members' lives. And then Andrea, if you could maybe talk about what that really meant in your life, what every aspect of your lives meant. Why they do that? You want me to speak to that? Yes, please. Well, you know, they're, they're control freaks. So the more they can control you, uh, the more they know they have you at their beck and call. So they want to control you in whatever way they can. And you know, you have to remember that in these groups, these are not democratic groups, right? They're, and there are no checks and balances. There's no way to hold the leader accountable to anything, right? So they see after, after time, they get away with more and more and more. And the more they get away with, the more they try and the more extreme it becomes. And that's some of the dangers of the groups that have existed a long time or the groups that are completely sequestered from society because nobody's seeing what's going on. And, you know, we can think about Jones at Jonestown, you know, he was drug addled. He'd been ruling the roost for so long. He was pretty much out of his mind by then, you know, um, and we can think of other leaders like that, Charlie Manson, you know, who got away with, you know, having people go out and kill for him. The more they can, the more they see they can get away with, the more they're going to try because that's what a narcissist is. That's who they are. And these are what my colleague Dan Shaw calls traumatic narcissists. Like being, mm -hmm. being in a relationship with them, being in their presence causes you trauma, right? They're not just, you know, a narcissist like, you know, somebody's boyfriend who just never stops talking and he's just so full of himself. This is a different, this is an extreme form of narcissism that is so damaging to the individuals who are in the midst uh, of that person's environment. Wow. Andrea, des describe what control was for you growing up and for the people that were in this group. And, and folks, this was a group that uh, on the high end, we think there were about 120 people, according to the leaders of the group. Uh, when, when we did the raid, there were 10 homes in a neighborhood, actually 13 homes, but we had search warrants for a smaller number of homes. And maybe you could just help them understand that. Um, and then, uh, Doc, if you would follow up with Darcy Ann's question here, that might be kind of interesting about, uh, do you think women in cults can be more manipulative toward members than men? Because in this group, the women were very destructive. But Andrea, please share that. So just to touch on what Dr. Lalich just said, that um, we were completely controlled. There was, we didn't watch television. There was no kind of, any kind of material outside, you know, Babylonian material. So every moment, every waking moment, someone knew where we were at. In fact, we had schedules on a piece of paper in half hour, if not even 15 minute increments. Wow. And a person older than us was in charge of us. So they would be know our schedule. We would do it together. They'd have a copy. And you couldn't just randomly wake up at nine and then, you know, sit on the porch with your morning coffee for an hour and just <laughs> ponder life and look at, watch the birds. Like every 15 to 30 minutes, you had to be somewhere and doing something. And, and we didn't leave the area, like hardly ever. So it was basically just a, you know, the one block radius. And, you know, it was housework, personal grooming, yard work, sewing, sexual activities, you know, pretty much every day, um, scripture study, more cleaning, more personal grooming. We had to bathe twice a day, which I ended up just despising. 
you know, we had to be prepared to have sex if we were going to be in bed with somebody. And yeah, it's amazing how our time filled up. I spent a lot of time sewing, actually. I sewed a lot of the things. In fact, I want to tell you, Mike, <laughs> I think this is a really good little tidbit to your book that I can tell people now is that the whole explanation of sweet things and lingerie business that we were doing is so ridiculous, first of all, the way now that I've had a business. It's like ludicrous that we were even doing that. It's like, it's hilarious. I was only 14. I was put in charge by Arvin, or I offered because he was so mad that we weren't really producing. And I volunteered to figure out how to run our production line. And I was in charge of the production line. Well, <laughs> explain that uh, Dr. Lalich uh, read the book in the early stages to give me some counsel along the way, but why don't you explain sweet things lingerie to the, to the yeah. audience listening. And then I'm sure doc will have a few questions for you. <laughs> I mean, it's really silly because I don't even know why we did it to begin with. I imagine because we thought we needed to make some money and we were, enough money wasn't coming in. I imagine that's how we started doing that. Um, Cause it's not like our designs or anything were that extraordinary. You could just get something on the market for much better. But we, I guess we were trying to market to strippers and like we thought we could get client. I don't even know. We just, between me and a couple other ladies in the cult, we had some great sewing skills. And I like, I, I don't even tell you, we had a, we had a lingerie company called sweet things and we didn't have one client. There you go. <laughs> you didn't have one client. I mean, we did this dumb little show in Ogden that I remember being embarrassed, even though I shouldn't have been embarrassed. I remember thinking, what the heck are we even doing here? It was pretty silly. The the group actually, uh, Dr. Lalich, uh, <laughs> used that to, to get local strippers to come and teach the cult members how to strip and how to dance provocatively. And, and uh, that was actually what caused uh, uh, the chink in their armor because an estranged husband learned about this and came up with a strategy to let them think that a, a buyer from Las Vegas in all the casinos wanted to buy their lingerie. And that's what actually got them in to get images of the children modeling lingerie and being sexualized and other kinds of things. So it really became uh, their downfall trying to somehow make it a money stream. Good Lord. That, that, I didn't know all those details of that story, by the way, Mike, and I just learned that today. And that was an incredible story, how they did that. What? Uh, I was there. They, so she took a video of us and I was in that video. It's super grainy, but I'm one of, I was only probably 16 at the time. This, this reminds me so much of the children of God. Um, do you, you know about that cult? It sounds no, I don't. You don't know about the children of God. Oh my God. I don't, I they were one of the big cults in the 70s. Um, and the leader, uh, David Berg, um, they, they started doing what he called flirty fishing, where the, the once you turned, I think, 16 or something, you would go, the, the women would be sent out to pick up men and have sex with them to bring them to Jesus. And it was basically like a huge prostitution ring. And when, when it got found out what they were doing, they then left the country and they went to Europe and they had compounds all over Europe, Asia, Eastern Europe. And um, so all the women were doing flirty fishing, had children with not knowing who, who the fathers were. And then David Berg decided that everybody should have sex with whoever they want to have sex with. And then he decided that the children should have sex with other children. And then the adults should have sex with children. And so it was the, the children who grew up in that group, there's the abuse was just horrific because then they've started farming out the children to other people. And I mean, it was like pedophile heaven and sex trafficking heaven. I mean, it was just disgusting. And there were thousands of members. Um, and the ones I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I've worked with so many who've come out of that group, uh, especially the ones who grew up in it, who have very horrendous relationships with their parents because most of the parents don't, won't sort of won't acknowledge that they allowed this to happen. Um, and don't apologize oh, for what, the, what happened to their children. I mean, it's, it's an, an incredible and they, they more the leader has died. There's now new leaders. 
They say they don't exist anymore, but they actually still do. They say they don't do the sex stuff anymore, but there's some indication that they still do, not to the extent they did before, but um, it sounds, I mean, that, I, I, Andrea, I am so sorry that you had that experience. And then to, to know where you are now, it really, it truly is remarkable. You have to have a burning desire to, to, to be a functional human being. Right. Because it was really hard for many years and I felt like a lead sure. weight was trapped to my to me and I was in water and I could, I wasn't drowning, but I couldn't swim. Yeah. And that really persisted for so long. And I've literally been in about 15 years of therapy and I still am in therapy. Yeah. And it's, it's great. I can't even imagine, you know, I, I do a, um, a zoom support group on every other Saturday. If you're interested in doing anything like that or any of the other former members that you're in touch with, Mike. I think I might join sometime. I, I have my, my, my school's on the weekend. Um, but oh, not okay. Weekend, so okay. It's not every weekend. So we, we actually talked about that with uh, mm -hmm. the survivors and they would love to do that with you, Dr. Lalich, and, and at least spend one session to kind of get a feel and then let them individually slip in and, and participate because I know that's an ongoing thing. You know, I wanted to mention, and it's really hard for people, uh, even it was really hard for our, our law enforcement officers, our judges, our community to understand the the depth of this perversion that was going right. on. Right. Uh, when we when we did the Dr. Phil show, I remember mentioning, he asked how many counts of, of uh, rape and sexual assault did the children endure? And I said that we quit counting at 4,000. And I remember Andrea and all of the uh, survivors on the stage saying, double it. Um, maybe you could speak at a high level, mm -hmm. Andrea, to what that really meant and, and to give people an idea, because when you say it happened daily, people have a hard time accepting that, but it was happening daily to 32 children in a group. Well, our group was a little more unique in that it wasn't just Arvin, it was every single woman and he made us participate with sex with women. Like we always had a, a situation where we we're supposed to be joining up and bonding and and so any touch is, is an assault. And we shared, you know, we shared beds with women. So you never had your own private space. You could never sleep alone. So Arvin, I engaged with him. I don't even know once, twice, three times a week. If I had gained a little bit of weight, you didn't get the phone call. So it was kind of a, you were going to go to hell, but then you have to fuck him, you know, sorry, Mike. <laughs> and um, with women, I mean, it was, it was, that was constant. So it was, you were just expected. You like you couldn't just say no. I don't feel like it. I mean, I remember a a woman coming through who actually was a lesbian and kind of had the energy of a lesbian, and she took me on a date. And you can't just say no. So I'm this young little teenage tart, and she's like a middle aged lesbian. And I remember probably more so than any of the women that I had engaged with feeling that that was, I was being raped when we finished our date in bed. And, you know, I, you just, that was what you did. He didn't, I think one time I actually had the guts to go to the character Carla in, in Mike's book and say, I cannot have sex with this person. I, I mean, cause she was the, the, she was the age of my mother and I just did not, I couldn't do it. And I, and I actually, it's interesting that I even had the guts then to, to just say no. That was the only time I remember saying no. Was she in the group? Yeah. Oh yeah. She was, you know, but they paired us up, you know, and they, it was, you didn't have a choice. And so you had to sexually engage. You know, it was interesting and maybe you could speak to this and then Yanya, I'd love to have your opinion of this. These homes were next door to each other in a small community. They were taking over an entire cul-de-sac or I mean an entire neighborhood. And uh, and children were stripped from their parents and living a, a house or two away mm -hmm. and would go sometimes six or eight months without ever seeing their children and the parent not putting any effort to come and see the child. And Andrea, maybe you could speak to that. And then I'd like to know what your thoughts are, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lalich. Mm -hmm. So like I said earlier, we were essentially moving to the neighborhood before my parents even bought a house. And I have no idea how much time passed. I'm guessing a few weeks to a few months by the time they actually joined. And they literally lived four houses away 
from where I was living with Arvin and, and the women in the four houses. And I mean, they just did a really good job of brainwashing my sister and I right away that those were no longer our parents. They weren't our guardians. They were just other members of the cult. So I didn't even, and I didn't have a like a strong bond anyway with my parents. I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, and so I didn't feel that I should go home around the corner and check in with them. And, and nobody encouraged it. I, I mean, there was a couple of times when outside people that were not part of the cult would come and visit my parents and they sent us along. They sent my sister and I along. We'll go make sure that you hang out at your parents' house so everything looks normal. And I mean, even when my brother came home from a mission, we did that. We came over and he, we just acted. It wasn't like he said, well, where's your bedrooms? He, he just, you know. And so I saw them. I don't even know. You know, yeah, once a month, once every whenever, just on the street. And yeah. I, I'd like to I'd like to invite people if you have questions directly for Dr. Lalich or for Andrea, and of course they can choose not to answer those, but feel free to put those in in the back office. We'll put them up. Dr. Lalich, maybe you have a couple of thoughts on just that comment, and then I'd like you if you could to maybe talk <laughs> about this characteristic of cults that suggests that we separate people from their support systems in order to maintain control of them. Right. Well, it it's actually quite common in cults for children to be separated from their parents. I mean, I've seen that time and again. Um, they're, they're either raised collectively in some, you know, collective environment where maybe even in a lot of cases, it's even the older children who are taking care of the younger children, um, or they're literally given to different families. Um, and that, you know, that's the purpose of that, of course, is to, to break the familial bond. Um, it's to uh, show that the only, the only loyalty, <clears throat> the only loyalty you can have is to the leader. You don't have loyalty to your parents. Parents don't have loyalty to their children. The loyalty only goes one way and that's up to the leader. Uh, so by separating people, it just reinforces that part of the belief system. Um, it's one of the, you know, it's it's obviously a control mechanism. Um, and it means uh, it means that your the attachments that you do have are with the cult leader. And so um, a colleague of mine, Alex Stein, she's written a wonderful book called Terror, Love and Brainwashing. Yeah. And she uses attachment theory, uh, which is this idea that um, when you have a healthy attachment relationship, when you're in trouble, you, you go to that person for help, right? Or to hold you and hug you or whatever, make you feel safe. But in these, in, in these cult environments, who you end up going to is the cult leader who's actually the source of your misery because there, there is no other attachment. So it just is, becomes this vicious cycle. Um, You've just and, described all my relationship problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I know about attachment theory and you just described it all. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's very common within cults. And pe again, it's one of these things where people on the outside say, you know, how could she have given her daughter to David Koresh to have sex with at age 12? Or how could she have, you know, uh, left her children to go join Heaven's Gate? This is a very common phenomenon within cults. It is remarkable the number of comments in the chat window. And one of our New Zealand friends, Kiwi Nana, uh, just indicated she was in a cult from age eight to 39 and the trauma still is real 20 years later. And maybe, uh, maybe Andrea, you could talk about the fact for a moment of, of that. Yeah, you're doing incredibly well, but that, that demon you've told me just pops up all the time and you have right. to just push it back down. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm doing, thank you, Michael, use your words incredibly well. I don't always feel that way is because I have done so much work, literally yeah. just workshops and books and multiple different types of therapy. And I still am in therapy and I happily though, like I wanted it, I need it. And I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, I know I was 12, but eight years old and for almost 30 years, um, cause your brain has, has been wired to 
to behave a certain way and think a certain way and respond a certain way. And when you leave a cult, you can't just turn that off because you're, 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 you've developed that way. Right. And that's why I still struggle with some of the same issues of perfectionism and, and, and searching for love in the wrong types of way, because that's what you're, that that's how you're, you, you developed, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I mean, I just didn't develop, you know, speaking of attachment theory, I didn't have a secure attachment even as a baby. So I learned how to um, satisfy my own needs for myself inside of myself. So I'm definitely an avoidant attachment style where if someone isn't giving me what I want, I'm like, that's okay. I'll just go shut down and go in the little corner and figure it out on my own. Um, Dr. Lalich, how much does this... uh and I'm not suggesting this at all with you, Andrea, I'm thinking now about adults who end up falling into some of these, but how much does the victim mentality contribute to involvement in a cult? Victim mentality? You mean? Yeah, I'm just kind of a victim. The world's after me. I mean, I've, I've been listening a lot in all these conspiracy theories that are jumping up and, you know, you're a victim, you've been victimized, you've been, and, and I, I see this kind of, cultish behavior going on. And I just wonder for some people, life is just always something that's impacting them rather than being agents that kind of change things. Yeah, I think, uh, I think what we're seeing, I think, you know, you're describing QAnon and some of the things that we're seeing in our society today. Um, uh, Some of the other groups, uh, conspiracy and otherwise survivalist, whatever. I think that that victim mentality does, uh, does lend to that. And it, it gives, it, it, it provides a community for those people. Um, I don't think, I think that's somewhat different from what we've seen in the past in terms of who, as we were saying earlier, who gets into cults. Um, It's almost like the difference between cults and gangs. You know, there are a lot of similarities, but, uh, people go to gangs, I think, for survival, right? And they um, they see they feel that it's necessary for their own safety and protection to be part of a gang. Otherwise, they're you know they're going to get killed. They get killed anyway. But um, so it, there's always been that difference in sort of how we looked at who got involved with cults and who got who got into gangs. And of course, there's also um, class and economic differences as well. But um, I, I don't think, I, I, I don't think it's typical of the victim idea it, in the, what, what I'm now calling the run of the mill cults, <laughs> but what this phenomenon that we're seeing today in our country, especially, um, and also in some other countries, um, I think that that is feeding into it and people are preying on that idea to recruit those people. Wow. Um, Andrea, what do you recall about the mind control that was going on in the group? I mean, it was constant in every aspect of our lives. Um, I think it's really easy to control someone like me, who was, first of all, just a child and who already had that way of thinking from the way that my mother was conducting her life. And it was, I I mean, I was like the perfect victim for Arvin. And just fear, like fear that you're going to not get into heaven when you die. That's really was the bottom line, honestly. And for a child, that is like the most desperate fear imaginable because it's not just like, oh, you'll get grounded or you were going to turn TV off for a week. No, it's that the biggest fear on this planet is that you're not going to get into heaven. I mean, now I don't even care about that, but it's that, you know, because I've talked about this with therapists so many times now is what is this fear associated with? now when my triggers happen now and it's like well then you were going to get kicked out of the family you were going to be banished from the family and banished to hell if you didn't do whatever they wanted you to do right so every waking moment was about pleasing them so that you could feel welcomed into the family unit and as we were talking earlier so i think someone somebody mentioned down there can can women be more you know divisive than men 
And Mike, I think you agreed with that, that especially after reading your book and about the tactics that I probably wasn't as aware of because I was younger is they would guilt us. And like, almost if you did something wrong and you had, you know, quote unquote, lost the spirit, they would kind of just stop talking to you and like energetically shun you. And so you didn't want to lose favor with your sister wives because then, you know, you just felt too much shame. Wow. So yeah, you just. So Dr. Lalich, um, the question from the bassoon guy is are men or women more manipulative in cults? And then Andrea, I'm going to let you maybe re answer to that one more time. As far as the Zion society, uh, this was brushed upon, but never addressed men or women who who's more uh, manipulative in a cult. You're asking me. Yes. Um, I think it really depends upon the cult. Um, it and it depends on how individuals are used by the leadership or how how people are trained to be the um, the lieutenants or the managers or whatever they're called in whatever particular group. So, for example, in the group I was in that had both men and women, uh, the the women the women were always the top leadership. And most of the of next level of what we call the middle level le leadership were also primarily women. So obviously in that case, uh, the women were more, you know, more, more manipulative and, and were the disciplinarians. Um, that, that isn't true across the board. It's really gonna depend on the structure and the population of the group and how, how the leader has, has set up the hierarchy. Um, so in, especially in these polygamous groups, we, we have seen that the, the sister wives have a lot of power and there's a hierarchy among the sister wives. And so one could say, oh yeah, it's really the women who are doing this. Um, but that's because that's how it's set up. It's because there's an abundance of women and, and it's a way to keep them controlled. And by give, you know, it's, it's, it's what we also see in, in uh, brothels and in sex trafficking, where you have the women who are running the other women. Um, it, so it, it, it depends on the structure, uh, obviously of the group and, and what the population is and what, what the, what it's going to serve for the group. I don't think inherently women are more manipulative than men. Um, men tend to be more powerful, be, be more assertive and more aggressive because that's still today how, how boys are raised in our society. Um, it doesn't have yeah, to be interesting that. point. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And um, I, I want to hold on this question, Aunt B, but I'm going to get to it. Okay. Andrea, describe the women's role in the Zion Society. Well, your um, Carla, your character in, in your book, I was just as scared of her as I was Arvin. Um, and, and I found that you characterized her very interestingly in your book and in a way that I wasn't even aware of as a, as a teenager, because I had a limited view of what was happening around me. Um, and just her own zealousness and being like the tattletale that you described her as was super interesting. And like that, her kind of getting off on that. And I could see how that really kept going in the Zion society because she, it seemed like she really just enjoyed being like Arvin's henchman and just like, she was the one that made it all happen truly. And so I was terrified of her. <laughs> like next, it's interesting. Cause it's like with Nexium, which uh, the, the Keith Raniere's cult, he sounds so similar actually uh, in the things that he did, but he also had Nancy Salzman who was kind of his second in command and he never could have done it without her. I have a feeling, I have the same feeling about Carla is that I, I think that he, she probably just helped come up with some ideas of how to facilitate more abuse and more sexual fun. And, you know, yeah, they had all kinds of wild and crazy ideas that I'm not going to go into right now that we had to do. Yeah, we, well, folks, uh, make sure you get the book and read it because we cover a lot of that stuff in there. But, but uh, doctor, I want to bring up this uh, question from Aunt B, and I, I just love these names that we have pop up. <laughs> After the cult was exposed and prosecutions were completed, quite a few of the Zion Society adults went on to join other cults. Um, how common is that? 
Well, it's what we call cult hopping. And uh, we do see it, especially if people don't go through any kind of recovery process or, or what we call psychoeducation. I mean, if people <clears throat> get out of a group but don't do the kind of self-reflection that Andrea's done and try to figure out what, you know, what in the world happened to me and how did I get there and, um, you know, what what was the system that was imposed upon me and and what did it do to me and how can I now change those habits? Um, it's very easy to then fall into another group that may be similar or may be very different. Um, but because people haven't, um, they haven't done the self-examination and they don't have their hackles up. You know, for most people like Andrea, I can swear she'll probably never get into another group and she can probably spot a group 20 miles away. Yeah. Uh, because when you do that kind of work, you know, you're, uh, you know what it's about. So, uh, and you, and you you can easily recognize it. And if you don't do that work, it's very easy to then fall right back into something. Yeah, I mean, when I look at Andrea, I'm just still today, I am just so proud of her. And the question I would have for you, Dr. Lalich, and then Andrea, I'd like you to respond to this is, um, who has the better chance of recovery? A child who becomes this generationally trained individual or this convert who goes in and tries something out? Oh, do you want me to go first? Sure. That'll give the doc a minute to think. Um, definitely the convert, in my opinion, because at least they've had some sort of a lifestyle that had to do with normal society, we would assume. Mm -hmm. They know cultures, they've watched a lot of television, they've talked to other types of people. Um, so one of the members of the Zion Society had a young child when we arrived, and it was actually Arvin's child. That child um, went on to join the same cult that my mother joined. So she was born into it. She was born the daughter of a cult leader. And I'm pretty sure she's still down there where my mother is involved in that cult in Southern Utah. Well, that's another one I didn't know about. And I, yeah. every day I learn of another. Yeah, You put four in your book and I'm like, no, there was more than four. <laughs> and there were some people in that third cult that was in the first cult that didn't join the second cult. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Dr. Lalich? Well, I, I, I agree with Andrea. I think it's um, much more difficult for children uh, who were raised in a cult uh, because they don't have, they haven't had a life before um, that That's they can. Yeah, I right. don't they, have, they have no reference. They, they have no idea if they, some, some cases, if they have other relatives out there or whatever. And so there's nothing to fall back on, you know, whereas if you're, if you join a cult as an adult, you've presumably had some kind of life before then. But when your entire formative experience is, is in a cult, um, you've got to redo absolutely everything. And, and you don't have like old friends you can go back to and things like that. So, um, you know, which is like what I did. I would say to people, you know, what was I like before, you know, or, something, or remind me of things we did yeah. together. So it's very, wow. very difficult. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book. And, um, and it's one of the reasons I think that we have to do so much work in training helping professionals, therapists and social workers and EMTs and people who are, be, can be familiar with um, people coming out of these kinds of environments and what they need. And I just wanna answer the question to the person who asked about the exclusive brethren. Yes, I do know about the exclusive brethren and actually um, in, interviewed some of them for my book. And there, there is quite a lot of reference to exclusive brethren in that book, Escaping Utopia. Wow. Well, um, you, I you could know, talk I'm, all night with you guys. I just think this is fantastic. Well, <laughs> well that's going to be my question because I've already <laughs> taken you both longer than you signed up for. And I'm hoping that you will come back. I, I just can't believe the comments that are streaming in and out. And, and folks, even for those who uh, Kiwi Nana just asked about if the book is going to be available for international sales in about a month or so. We're going to actually 
roll out internationally. So we're so sorry that the hardbound book, which we wanted to control, uh, we're having to ship, and there's obviously expenses there. Sarah Beth, uh, can companies use cult yes. tactics? And boy, we've seen many companies use yes. that, but why and don't you speak to that? Absolutely, and especially many of the multi-marketing companies. Um, in fact, right now I'm involved in a lawsuit related to that. So um, m- many of the MLMs use the, the same kind of influence and control tactics, especially at their sort of events that they put on uh, to pressure people to um, keep investing more time and money. I mean, my mother was involved in those. So yes, <laughs> Jackley, Herbalife, you know, she was a joiner. Yeah. So, so Andrea, just uh, a few months ago, we, we talked and, and you sent me some pictures after visiting with your mother. Um, what, what is that relationship like and how do you manage that relationship knowing that she continues to live in environments that you found destructive for you? I mean, I don't know if she'll ever see this and it doesn't really matter, but ultimately I, I've lived my life without a mother and there was no way to, you can't have a mo- you can't have a mother who's still in a cult after she left you in a cult that kind of, that was so traumatized you. So there was a period in my, when I first started therapy that actually anytime I had any reaction with my parents, I ended up getting severely depressed. So I just kind of realized that I needed to distance myself. So there was a time where I didn't, come back to Utah for nine years and I didn't speak to them for a little bit because that's what I needed at that time in my, in my development. And I mean, unfortunately she's, so she's been in this cult that she's in now and actually the leader has died, but there's, she's still keeping things going um, for now, probably almost 28 years. Cause she'd found it within a year after ours ended. And yeah, my whole, all my siblings struggle with her because she's still a huge fanatic. You know, she's now into just extreme f- political fanaticism now. And I just delete her emails and yeah, we don't have a relationship, Mike. That's the short st- answer. Yeah. Is she in a polygam- another polygamous cult? She found one within less than a year of, of, of ours um, disbanding. Hmm. And, and, and she ended up actually marrying the leader, you know, over prayer, they decided that my father was not her eternal companion. So basically he was free because he didn't, he was never going to leave her, but he got set free. Um, And then he went to live his life and she's been in that cult ever since. Um, And, you know, she married the cult leader, then he died and then the cult transitioned. And she still wants to hold on to a community and and a purpose. And she needs that like a drug. Uh, all of us should have gone to Al-Anon. We, we were like children of an addict. She needs it or she's not okay. She needs that intensity, that zealousness, the we're fighting for a cause, you know, it's now it's all about politics and yeah, it's. Dr. Lalich, um, <laughs> is social media and the internet creating um more cults with all these conspiracy theories, with all this ability to share information. Just give me a sense of what you think is happening as a result of social media. You mean share disinformation? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And the fact that, that wacky minds, I mean, one of the things about the Zion Society is this was like-minded people that wanted to be in this group. But now all of a sudden, I can find like-minded people all around the globe. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely had an impact. And I think especially during the pandemic, uh, because people aren't going out. And and so they're, they're probably on their computer more. Um, the internet has really been a double-edged sword because there's also a great deal of information about cults on the internet. Um, where former members have set up websites, um, you know, people who've attended something have written critiques and posted it. So, you know, one of my wishes is that before people jump into something, they they do better research, you know, be better consumers. Like, you know, you don't buy the first car you look at and you shouldn't jump into the first thing that you're going to give away yourself to. 
and your uh, independence and your decision-making abilities. But anyway, so the the internet's very good for that as well as, as a source of information, a good information about cults. But um, it also has, I, I think it has definitely increased the, the number of people who are getting recruited over the internet. I used to always say that it took personal contact to get someone recruited into a group, but th that's clearly not true anymore. Um, because these online communities are clearly very powerful. Um, even if they get kicked off certain apps, they find new ones or they create new ones. And they um, and there's there's a great deal of of pressure within those communities. So the same kind of peer pressure that we would see in a physical cultic group, we're, we're seeing in the online communities. Oh, amazing. Dr. Lalich, will you come back? Yes, absolutely. I love this. This has been wonderful. wonderful. And Andrea, you, I hope you will come back. I'll come back anytime. <laughs> I, I, I would like Andrea to respond to something and then Doc, if you would as well. Um, I remember the first comment or the first co communication that Andrea and I had when we met after 30 years was last April. And we did it by a phone call after, and she had actually reached out to me two years earlier asking me for help. And I uh, very ashamedly today say I didn't respond favorably. It took me a while to adjust. But uh, when we got on that phone call, the after our initial greeting, the first thing, Andrea, out of your mouth, and I'd like you to maybe just respond to this, was, uh, Mike, I hated your guts for 15 years. <laughs> Why don't you talk about what leaving a cult is like. And then Yanya, if you would as well, please. Um, it really is not to be silly, but it really is like getting out of a spaceship and landing on a different planet. Because especially for me, like such a young age, I mean, we're products of our environment. We get fed information constantly, even before digital age, we still get fed information constantly with our, with anything in our environment. And because mine was so limited, you know, I mean, it's really hard to put into words how sheltered and how limited the information was that went into my brain. But it's it was my, my joke is that I was I was raised by wolves in a, in a cave. You know, um, so when I got out into the world, I, I mean, I, actually, I, I developed amazing observation skills because that's really all I had. So I became overly like to a, an exhausting level observant of my environment. So I would just almost have like a Rolodex of information in my head. And I would constantly scan my environment looking for information to figure out what to do with it, how to make sense of it. And I mean, even before I started school in my early 30s, I felt so dumb and naive and I knew I was dumb and naive and it bummed me out. And that's why I was so motivated to go to school because I just hated feeling that way. So it was really about just trying to figure things out. Like, 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 like reading your book today and how you were trying to learn when Arvin was lying to you and you're in, when you're interrogating him and, 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 and reading how you knew what he was doing based on the veins in his neck and you could figure out what was happening in his head. I mean, I've developed those, those similar skills, just watching people and watching life and trying to figure it out. And, it's probably turned my brain into an obsessive, like overproduction information because I just started it as a, you know, early on. <laughs> wow. I'm just, a, my Doctor, brain just developed in a strange way, just very curious. Yeah. Dr. Lalich, what about you? Well, I think leaving a cult, um, I mean, it's different with this situation where the place was raided and busted up, but if a person decides to leave a cult, I think it's it's um, one of the hardest decisions they'll ever make because you're giving up your whole world and you're giving up your whole worldview. And it's like suddenly the rug is going to be ripped out from under you and nothing makes sense anymore. So it's absolutely terrifying. Um, and there's a there's this funny feel. I know for me, there was this funny feeling of like freedom, like, oh, my God, I just been let out of prison. But at the same time, I was, I I was afraid to cross the street. I mean, I was forty one years old. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a kid. I was, you know, I I joined it as an adult. But I felt like a, a I felt like a stupid sixteen year old. Um, and so I think it's um, 
it's one of the most difficult things someone will ever do. And that's why I think for people who have someone in a cult that they're trying to help, it's so important to just really be there for that person because you need to, you need to feel that there's a safe haven that you can go to. And so if your family or your friends or whoever have kept themselves open to you as that safe haven, that's going to help you leave. And you just want to go somewhere where people aren't going to harp at you. They're not going to say, see, I told you so. Um, they're not going to say, how could you have been so stupid? They're just going to let you decompress and, and wend your way through it. It's a rough road. I call it, I, I talk about it as the recovery roller coaster, but it's definitely worth the ride. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. You uh, you have been so kind to me, Dr. Lalich. I um, I want to just say that uh, one of one of my favorite uh, endorsements came from you, and it, with your permission, I'd like to read it. Sure. <laughs> Uh, and, and maybe we could put up folks, if you want to, want to get this book, Zion society, we're going to continue to talk about, it. I actually got a note from somebody today saying, haven't you talked about that enough? And uh, sorry, we're only getting started because there are, um, we, we've only touched on the tip of the iceberg, but from Dr. Lalich, uh, I can think of no more important book at this moment in our history than profiling evil an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. And actually, that was the original name, Profiling Evil. We changed it to Deceived, an investigative memoir. Mike King has made a superb and vitally important contribution by exposing the abuse of women and children in that heinous cult. And this happens far too often in the multitude of harmful groups around the world. If you want to understand coercive influence and control, then read this book. Dr. Lalich, any thoughts as we wind down? And then I'd like to hear from you, Andrea. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts, but <laughs> I just want to thank you for doing this. And I'm sorry I couldn't be on when it was scheduled earlier, but um, I've, 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 I think what you're doing is wonderful. I'm so happy to have met Andrea. Um, I just think you're a superstar. And I hope I get to meet you in person one day, with or without a mask. Uh, I mean, with a mask if the pandemic's still going on, but hopefully <laughs> one day we won't have to wear masks. Um, and I just think, you know, the more we can educate the public about these groups, uh, the more lives we'll save. Thank you, Dr. Lalich. Andrea? I mean, my final thoughts are just if you're in any situation where you feel like you're stuck and you can't really make life that you want, you actually really can. It just takes a burning desire and a lot, a lot of hard work and never giving up. And that's what's gotten me here today. And I'm still going. I hope to publish my own memoir at some point. And I'm just, you know, the sky's the limit. You just have to have a burning desire and you have to never give up. Right. Thank you. Folks, go to, uh, now give, help me get the name right, dandyjewelry.com. <laughs> dandyjewelry.com. We'll put that up at the bottom. And Dr. Lalich, cultresearch.org is one of the most compelling websites. The, the content you have on there, I, I would just recommend everyone to go to Dr. Lalich's website and look at the 20 questions to help you analyze whether you're dealing with a cult behavior or a group of with cult behaviors. And uh, we are definitely going to, to have you back. We have so much to talk about, and I cannot thank you both enough. And folks, if any of you feel in any way uncomfortable in situations where you are, it probably will not get better. Get out as quickly as you can. Get to your local medical or mental health provider or call your local police department where I believe there is a cadre of people trained and ready to help get you the, the support that you need. And, uh, and we'll plan on seeing you all soon. And again, thank you to all of you. Have a great evening. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye.